today's speaker, Justin Blackwell, is curator of, the horticult of horticulture at the Land Sioux Portland Chinese Garden. He came to the Portland Chinese Garden in 2018, and in his role as curator of horticulture, he promotes and implements authentic and cultural standards and develops arts programs such as Penjing program and Chinese floral arts, among others. He studied landscape at South Seattle College and garden studies at the Kyoto University of Art and Design in Japan. From 2006 to 2018, he worked at the Portland Japanese Garden, where he learned the craft of Japanese garden design and was also an instructor on pruning, bamboo fences, stone pathways, and garden buildings. So for some people in our audience, he may be a familiar face if you um, have liaised on um, with the Japanese garden. Um, he has a lot of new ideas in store for the Lansu Chinese garden, and we're excited to hear about his presentation today. So please join me in welcoming Justin Blackwell as our speaker today. Um, so uh, I'm the curator of horticulture at Lansu Chinese garden. And um, so really this is just kind of a, a, an arc, if you will, or a broad stroke of um, uh, kind of what we are as an organization, but specifically talking about our, um, our uh, botanical plant collection, uh, the things that we've gone through and changes we've gone through that we've had to go through um, and adjust uh, because of COVID. And, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we are doing and kind of the future and the things that we're very excited about uh, bringing to Lanzu or uh, revisiting um, that maybe had been part of the garden a long time ago and is now finding some new life. Um, so first, I wanted to uh, make a, a little bit of a, a distinction. So um, when people think of Chinese gardens or they think of Chinese plants, they may not always um, specifically connect it to Chinese culture. And I know that sounds odd or funny, but um, there's a two different narratives that are very prevalent. Um, I would say one narrative that's very prevalent um, as a Western narrative, but uh, that we all learn in, um, in school when we're uh, going to landscape design school or learning about horticulture, um, about a lot of plants that are, that are found in China and native to China. Um, but there's two different stories behind that. Um, one, and this is uh, from a friend of mine, William McNamara, he'll actually be giving a talk at Lansu in January. Um, but so this is something he sent me, I thought was very interesting. So the Western narrative generally is uh, the golden age of plant hunting. Um, so as many of you know the names like Robert Fortune, David Armand, um, and so forth. Uh, the arrival of ornamentals from another country or region has always stirred excitement among gardeners and plant lovers. For temperate plants, China has been by far the major source of this excitement in the last few centuries. And this was uh, <clears throat> recent, you know, in retrospect. The height of this took place during the golden age of plant hunting in China in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And it still continues today. It began with French missionaries and later professional plant hunters from Europe searching for new ornamentals for nurseries and wealthy patrons. Um, much of this ended in the 20th century, mid 20th century due to wars and revolutions. A resurgence of interest began in the night, uh, again in the 1980s with several expeditions to remote regions of China through the uh, goals, ways, and means have changed somewhat. Much remains the same in these new efforts to adorn our gardens with novel ornamentals from afar. I know that was a mouthful. Um, so that's, I believe, how a lot of uh, people see um, uh, you know, our plants in a Chinese garden or plants that are uh, native, to garden, uh, native to China, rather. Um, however, there is a, a, 
a narrative that I think gets forgotten um, and not talked about as much perhaps in uh, general, but uh, being a, a curator of a uh, cultural organization that promotes Chinese culture, uh, I, I, when I examine the narrative, I find more of this, and that's the Chinese narrative, which is 4,000 years of ornamental horticulture development. Um, so the 4,000 years before kind of a European expansionist um, uh, era, um, Peter Valder, he actually, um, I believe he's Australian, uh, he kind of wrote what uh, many uh, Westerners would call uh, the Bible of uh, garden plants. Um, and he has a very non-biased um, uh, opinion when it comes to such things. And in the light of such excitements, we tend to forget that the Chinese plants which have had the greatest influence have come to us not from the wild, but from Chinese gardens, or perhaps more correctly, from Chinese nurseries. And I find when you um, really kind of do some research, you find that um, there, you know, before the golden age of um, horticulture as uh, or plant hunting as some people say there was 4,000 years of of a, a golden era if you will of innovation uh, developing plants uh, discovering plants cultivating and this is uh, outside of the the near uh, the um, you know growing plants for food you can grow plants for strictly ornamental reasons and not have to grow them for fruit or uh, other other foods and um, so it, it's interesting uh, also when you examine the, the, uh, the history of Chinese um, horticulture mm -hmm. in China, um, that even with some of the, um, some of the uh, plant hunters that came uh, in the 1800s, like uh, Robert Fortune, James Cunningham, um, and you might recognize species names like Delvei and uh, Stewardia and things like that, Fortunae. Um, a lot of these were discovered in the wild, but there's also a um, an interesting uh, discovery that a lot of those plants were not discovered um, by uh, Fortune or uh, Armand David. Um, for example, like the Cunninghamia, which is the China fir, named after James Cunningham. He named it when he brought the seeds back from China in, uh, I believe, 1700. He brought them back to England, and I believe they became very, very big hit. But however, um, if you look back in history, they were actually described first and found that we know of by a man named Jihan in 304 uh, CE, or our common era, AD, and he named it Shanmu. Um, and for centuries it had been used uh, for uh, lumber. And so it's interesting how we, uh, we claim it as a discovery by James Cunningham, but it had, uh, had been used for, for uh, 1500 years before uh, uh, he, discovered it. Um, another example in our garden is uh, like Mohonia fortunae, which was found in a nursery in Shanghai. Uh, but before that, it, you know, or I'm sorry, um, before it was uh, brought to uh, England by uh, Robert Fortune, I believe it was named after him uh, just because of his contributions to the um, plant hunting industry, it had been um, it had been a favorite in China for centuries. Um, and it was a plant name that they named blue and yellow bamboo. And actually when you it's a when you any mahonia when you cut the stem, it's very, very yellow um, on the uh, on the, the the pith and the cambium layer and the leaves have a slight bluish tinge. To them, I guess, if you compare it to the green of moss or other plants. Um, so, and the list goes on, like Dracaeocarpus fortunae, 
as a windmill palm have been used for centuries uh, for its fibers, but rarely used in uh, Chinese gardens. And then uh, um, the list goes on and on. So it's uh, it's interesting how I think uh, our our current um, our current system of of naming too can be misleading. And uh, when you examine the Chinese narrative, um, I find a very interesting story indeed. So uh, there, you know, the the Western narrative, of course, is uh, is um, it, you know, like I said, William McNamara is going to be uh, doing a talk. So there's a there's a place for that at a Chinese garden. But however, that's not necessarily who we are um, as a Chinese garden. We are um, definitely, um, you know, Chinese culture isn't about necessarily a geographic location. Um, it's about the people and the history within the location. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> And here's a, an aerial view from my office. Very lucky am I to have this view um, 10 stories up. Uh, so this is Lanzu Chinese Garden from above. And um, here is also a place where uh, Chinese culture is, uh, is, is celebrated and is promoted and is taught. We're in an educational um, cultural uh, institution and so we educate um, most of the people that come through our doors are tourists from all over the country. And this could be their only experience with Chinese culture that they ever have. So uh, we uh, really strive to um, uh, really give them the, the, the true model of, of, of not just uh, the architecture and, and the, um, the stories and the poetry which, which we tell and not uh, try to uh, edit it for necessarily uh, for American consumption, but also our, our plant material too, which, um, you know, does that match up to our, our uh, the Chinese cultural narrative? So it's been very interesting. Um, and I think that this is conversations that people have had before, potentially everywhere, but um, I'm excited to, to, uh, to, to me, it's it's uh, you know it's been very enlightening um, and exciting indeed. Um, so so what does that mean for for Lan Su? Um, when I started about three and a half years ago, um, you know, new curator to everybody, everybody wants their two cents heard a little bit, but. Um, I really heard the main thing that I heard from most people, mainly um, um, Chinese members, was that the garden was so Americanized or so Westernized. I didn't know how to respond to that except for, um, you know, I strive to um, honor the, uh, the true, the, um, the Chinese cultural uh, perspective and listen to those voices and listen to voices that may not have necessarily been heard in the past. So here we are. Um, and so what does that look like for uh, Lan Su? Well, it started out with a lot of excitement and a lot of, oh my, you know, uh, the sky's the limit. And then, um, uh, you know, that began with, well, so Lan Su is 21 this year. Tw uh, 2020 was our 20th anniversary. And um, uh, so we were going to have a big celebration in 2020, and obviously that didn't happen. So, but in uh, rewind to 2018, um, I came on board, and, and actually something I was aware of because I, I have been friends with the folks at uh, Chinese Garden, Glenn Argo before me, um, and Mandy. Uh, I was friends with them, had a relationship with them for years. So I kind of knew some of the struggles the Chinese garden had been having, um, health issues, soil issues. Um, I know for a long time they would come to, uh, while I was at the Japanese garden, they would come to us for, you know, how do we manage our pruning and, uh, and so forth. And so uh, by the time I, I got to Lan Su, I really had a good idea of what I was, the challenges were. And, the first one was bring this garden to a state of health. Um, I know recently um, one thing that I think Glenn, uh, she 
uh, unfortunately had to deal with was a lot of soil root rot uh, problems. So amar uh, amarilla, I'm probably mispronouncing that. If Carla, our uh, in, uh, integrated pest management uh, person was here, she would tell me, she'd correct me the, uh, um, <laughs> she'd correct me on the pronunciation. But uh, so lots of, and we had lost uh, a signature tree, uh, I believe it was the fall of 2017, maybe the um, old Gwei, which was the uh, signature Osmanthus we had in our courtyard at Tranquility. And there was a, uh, several plants that I think had uh, suffered from that. And I don't know the full story of what went when um, and why, but uh, so I know that was a, a prevalent issue. Even by the time I got there, there was a, uh, one tree that was just on its way out, a magnolia. And, um, and so it's always terrible when that happens. But so I realized right away that uh, we are, had an uphill battle with saving these plants, preserving our plants. And if we wanted to plant anything in the future, we need to make sure we are capable of maintaining them and taking care of them and, and having them live. Uh, so that was the challenge. Um, root rot, other diseases, phosphorus in the soil. Uh, we had a whole section of Phytophthora in the garden. Uh, Phytophthora is a misunderstood disease, which it's Phytophthora is everywhere, um, but it's the state of the soil that activates it. Perhaps if you uh, wet, not having enough drainage, then the Phytophthora will um, sort of bloom, for lack of a better word, and it could take over a plant, maybe not kill it, but make it look terrible for years. And that had happened with some of our collection um, over the years. Um, I had heard stories of some beloved plants to where they, they had uh, died because of certain diseases. And water retention and penetration was, um, so one first thing they did was tat uh, many key areas of the garden, um, uh, trees that were, in my opinion, uh, sort of uh, would, if, if they had died, you know, they would, it would be a, a terrible loss. So some signature trees like shore pine by our zigzag bridge inside the garden, um, uh, places like that, and a few uh, like a Japanese maple that we have in our uh, scholar's courtyard. And um, so it was what we discovered is that even a watering, uh, we would do hand watering, uh, spend several hours a day in the summer hand watering because uh, the irrigation system had been uh, out of commission for years. Um, and anyway, the, so the, the penetration was, it wasn't penetrating more than even an eighth of an inch down, if you can believe that. And this is after hours of hand watering. So everything was just basically sheeting off um, and not penetrating through. And of course, when you're watering at, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, that's really, there's hardly any point to that because it's going to evaporate anyway. Um, and, uh, and I think for years there was a, 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 a tactic of putting sort of this barky, dusty type stuff on everything. And that after a while, year after year, if you keep adding that, then that's uh, just a note for your home gardens also. Uh, that is what it creates is this sort of, uh, this impenetrable layer. Think of like that, like cardboard or, or something like pressed, that pressed board uh, um, and water cannot penetrate through because it's a million bazillion uh, feeder roots, that's a, a real number I'm, I'm hoping, um, of feeder roots because the plants were too happy with leaf debris um, and uh, bark chips. And so therefore the entire garden was, uh, surface was just one solid mat of feeder roots. So the, uh, there was no penetration happening. So um, we brought in, uh, we worked with a uh, amazing companies like Bartlett Tree Care, who came in and did some air spading on some of our key areas. And then we, for the first time, as far as I know, we uh, brought in um, an integrated pest management and nutrient management program, which the garden, you know, was suffering from aphids and azalea lace bug and, uh, like I mentioned, fungal issues and scale issues. And, um, 
And so it felt like the garden had been invaded and overrun with these these issues. And, you know, the garden, out of all fairness, is 21 now. And that's, a, you know, we're, we're maturing from a young, shiny, brand new garden to a, uh, um, we're entering a new phase where we're, we're mature. You know, we have to spend a lot of time and money maintaining our uh, roof lines and our mosaics and our, you know, so uh, <clears throat> our pond. So we're entering into a new phase where there it's, it's all about the maintenance um, of the garden. And uh, so uh, we basically hired <laughs> a bunch of beneficial insects, um, parasitic wasps, lacewing, um, air parasitic wasps, they really, uh, they target the aphids, lace wings. Of course, the azalea lace bug was a big problem. Um, and we got our rhododendrons. And also uh, scale. Um, we got, uh, so we, I think we brought in about, uh, the first year was like three or four uh, parasitic insects, or I'm sorry, beneficial insects. And then by year two, we brought in four more. Praying mantis finally, um, hatched. We did that for a couple of years, uh, no bueno, and then uh, finally hatched in um, um, a couple of years ago. And uh, so we really, uh, we really have been um, committing, committing ourselves, and be, uh, we're committed to the process of of not using so many uh, chemicals because uh, you have koi in the pond that could be affected by that. So we've really had to think differently about how we do things um, because of that. And uh, truth be told, um, in the last three years, I would say, and um, uh, Carla Lilly, our integrated pest management uh, coordinator would uh, back me up on this. I would say 90% of pests have been eradicated. Of course, it's an ongoing process. You have to keep um, keep the process going or these can come back. We also added mason bees, mainly for their cute factor. Uh, but uh, uh, so we're always adding new new bugs to our, our staff list, I like to jokingly say. And, um, and also they bring another layer of interest to the garden. Um, so uh, the only chemical that we use on anything is on our plum trees. Um, the plum trees were in a desperate state of decline um, in 2018. And uh, over time, we, you know, we had to um, do a lot of pruning for one thing. Um, many, many of the plants were overgrown quite drastically um, as if every bit of architecture was trying to be covered up the white walls covered in vines, the rocks covered in vines. So um, not only from a health point standard, but also a standard of um, uh, the, you know, basically every little bit of architecture is being covered by um, unruly plants. But for the, uh, for the plums, I digress, uh, the plums um, in the garden by our scholars hall had not one, not two, probably three fungal issues. Um, and so we had experimented with a few things and it, we used a spectrocyte on those and they're not near the koi pond. So we, uh, so that is the only chemical that we use and then it actually has brought them back to a state of health. You, this last year, we did not see, we saw very, very little evidence. Um, we had the soil uh, air spaded uh, with those plums. And, we, and so we uh, no longer have to do things like supplemental watering for those. They were always flag in the summer. So uh, we so we brought those to a state of health. Um, we were really worried. I was walking around, I don't know if you know Carol Guo is, and Carol Guo uh, and I, you know, when I first started, we walked around and, and I, I gave her a pledge, a pledge that I would bring those plums back to health. So I sort of, the pressure was on, it was, it was not just for the garden, it was for Carol Guo. And so we, we successfully did that. Um, 
And so I really feel like the maturing process can be tough. Uh, you're no longer trying to grow things to, to be mature. Now they're mature. And then now you have to bring them to the scale of the garden and uh, the balance of the garden, a healthy balance of the garden. So uh, erosion was a, a big uh, problem. Um, so we um, have implemented some special techniques like sweeping uh, the soil to keep the leaves out um, and that promotes the moss growth. So moss has pretty much has grown over any kind of spot of dirt in the garden, not as a feature, but as, a, um, as something to help prevent erosion and uh, planting things like ground cover bamboo, which we'll talk about, which also helps with erosion. So our erosion problem has reduced dramatically just by uh, fostering moss, no longer adding the bark chips and then in-ground fertilization, um, which uh, we have a special mix that we use and we use uh, pieces of bamboo to pound holes in, because now we have moss and ground covers everywhere. And then we add this mix in the late winter, very early spring. And this is a first for us. And so we did this for the first time last year. And um, this year, I have to say the garden has never looked better. So it looks lush, it's well watered. We also added an irrigation system. We got a nice grant from the Furstenberg Foundation. Thank you, Furstenberg. Um, we have an in-ground pop-up irrigation because um, before we had a drip irrigation system, which in theory, those are, if you have a small vegetable garden or something like that, a uh, drip irrigation is fine. But for a garden where you're hiding this irrigation tubes and uh, plant roots and plants might be getting moved around or you might be poking holes to fertilize, it, uh, that is what happened is that um, uh, drip irrigation system that had been in the garden previously had been chopped up into many pieces because of moving plants and various other things and was never, um, uh, was also contributing to some of the phytophthora issues and some of the, um, and, uh, the fungal issues uh, was that we had several leaks in this irrigation system. So the areas were getting inundated with water without the gardeners knowing um, without their knowledge. And so that contributed to the problem, uh, pro caused a lot of the problems actually. So uh, watering by hand was not the answer because I spent uh, literally three, four hours of every staff member's time every day from like June through September uh, and sometimes October. So that uh, was not a, a, an answer. There was so much that we couldn't do because of this. So we did get this pop-up irrigation system and it has been a godsend because in this triple, hit, uh, especially in light of when our planet, it's getting hotter. We saw that this summer, the triple digits of 118, that heat dome we had in June, we were not be no human. Well, unless you're maybe from Palm Springs, no human would be able to go out there for any period of time and, and water. We all kind of took turns going, I was out there five o'clock in the afternoon watering overhead because we had the irrigation, but plants like uh, rhododendrons and uh, hydrangeas, and the uh, hydrangea-like plants would just wilt. Um, in that kind of sun, even if they are getting irrigation. So we did a little bit of overhead watering and our potted plants are pungy. And, uh, but if we had not had that irrigation system in place, we may not, a lot of plants may not have survived or would have been damaged quite severely. And there was quite a bit of damage on certain plants. Um, of course, our pine trees sailed through it. Pomegranates, love it. Our lotus just, you know, were, couldn't have been happier. So a lot of plants did do fine and actually thrived, but then there was a lot of plants that had a lot of burn damage. And, but we, we made it through and thank goodness for that irrigation. Um, we were able to uh, implement our uh, integrated pest management um, program, for instance. So there you go. So that's kind of uh, where things have been for the last three years. You know, pruning has been a huge focus. Uh, there, I think Glenn, 
went through a while where she um, didn't prune things for uh, whatever reason, and that's fine, but uh, it was very clear, one of the main points of when I went through the interview process was the, the pruning, <laughs> so we lost sight of the pruning. So, uh, so we have done a lot, a lot, a lot of pruning. Um, and you know, and I'll talk more about that later. Like what, what is our standard for pruning? Uh, you know, I came from a Japanese garden and, you know, are we using these techniques? And um, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so anyway, I, I won't get us too more bogged down on this, but uh, challenge uh, all of this. So we accomplished our goals, and but we have to continue. We can't just stop here and be like, okay, and done. This is a yearly, monthly, quarterly thing that you have to pay attention to um, for a for a garden, um, not a huge garden, but still big enough um, for the size of staff that we have. Um, oh yes, everyone's favorite subject, COVID. Um, so March, I think it was the end of March, 2020, uh, like everything else, the garden closed to the public. We laid off everybody, but uh, let's see myself, I was, one of the few people left, a payroll person, because somebody had to pay me. Um, our executive director at the time, Jane DeMarco, and our development uh, fundraising um, person at the time. And uh, let's see, in our facilities person. Um, so there was just a tiny handful of us, and I was the one that I had to take care of the garden by myself and our greenhouse. Uh, where we had uh, thousands of chrysanthemums, which we um, grew our own chrysanthemums for our chrysanthemum festival every November. And also our lotus collection was in our greenhouse. Um, uh, so grown in um, sort of temperature controlled sort of uh, tubs at a greenhouse. And it was a greenhouse in Southeast Portland. Um, and uh, so, we had to close the greenhouse because I was, it was just me. First priority was the garden. And uh, so I had to think outside the box, how are we going to have a lotus collection and a chrysanthemum collection? Uh, so I had to manage expectations and I talked about it with my executive director at the time. And we just decided that, well, we have to protect our number one asset, which is the garden and uh, manage, think of, uh, think outside the box when it comes to how do we save these collections that rely on our greenhouse. So my first thought, and something I had been wanting to do actually for a while, um, was plant our lotus in the pond. And, uh, you know, I'd been told by people, oh, oh, they won't bloom. We don't have a hot enough season. Um, they just, and, you know, it's not gonna happen. And so, I just didn't take that for an answer. I had um, I had talked to uh, many um, many many uh, uh, lotus gardens around the country. Uh, Montreal Chinese Garden they have theirs planted in the pond year round. You know it gets very cold there. Uh, Chicago Botanic Garden also has uh, theirs planted in the pond. So it got me to thinking. It's like well we're Portland, Oregon, doesn't get nearly as cold there. Hmm. So I, I did, uh, you know, Hughes Water Gardens, uh, who was local, uh, um, got some advice from them and other places around the country. And the the uh, resounding the resounding answer was like, yes, you can do this, but this is you have to do it the right way. So we did. We uh, got in the pond in the best time of year to get in a pond. It was November, uh, December, twenty twenty. And um, we gathered rocks in the garden. Um, we couldn't drain the pond because we had a koi and goldfish in there. We couldn't drain the pond, so we gather. So we're in the pond, dragging these uh, taihu stones um, and stacking them, creating a bed with no mortar. Uh, the liners that we were using in the greenhouse beds for the lotus, we brought those in and we fashioned them, as you can see on the uh, left-hand side, fashioned them while the pond is still full. 
uh, and we um, and then we filled did our best to fill it in with some sandy loam, which is fairly neutral, um, and for the koi. And uh, and then we got in the pond and we planted these uh, lotus. We weren't able to plant 100% of them, but we took uh, our favorites basically, and uh, they survived the snow and ice. And you know we um, and then they had never ever ever looked better um, and they actually started um, they had bloomed more prolifically than I'd ever seen they actually started spreading outside of their bed that we built for them um, and perhaps one day <laughs> I don't know if I'm an advocate yet of this kind of scene at the in our pond but this is this is what you would see in China during um, lotus um, time during the summer and um, a sea of lotus and um so I, I felt very you know my fingers were crossed uh, all of our staff's fingers were crossed i was hoping just for at least some green leaves this year and we had a uh, an abundance of flowers they never looked healthier never looked bigger of course secret is in the fertilizing and we can talk more about that later if you have a question um chrysanthemums also so what do we do about our chrysanthemums we had thousands like i said um and right in 2019, I believe it was, our numbers suddenly dwindled because um, of an event um, <clears throat> by perhaps half. Uh, so, so um, you know, we, so that was uh, one thing that kind of worked against us. But I really quickly realized at the greenhouse that I could not take care of thousands of chrysanthemums and um, and also a garden. Um, so. So what we did is we, uh, you know, this was uh, some greenhouse volunteers that um, have been working with us and staff, and we all just put our heads together and said, well, what do we do uh, with, we're only able to keep a certain amount of chrysanthemums behind our bathrooms, for instance, and that's not a whole lot of space. Um, we selected 200 chrysanthemums, actually, and what do we do with those? What do we, how do we make it, if it's not going to be a big, bright, sort of show with thousands of chrysanthemums like before how do we do something special with less and it's kind of like more about how what you do with them and how you present them to make it interesting for people and uh, so right away chrysanthemum penjing which is a um, uh, we'll talk more about penjing later here on the left um, is an example mark vosbrink who many of you might know um, and some of his students, Michael Mill and Bartholomew, Babbitt Bartholomew, um, among others, uh, brought in, I want to say 50 this year. We brought in some last year. And for about 50 chrysanthemum penjing throughout the garden. And they're all stunning. And, um, you know, a uh, has a cultural, like we were talking about Chinese cultural connection to it. And then also we developed some cascades. Um, which is also a, a, a traditional Chinese, also Japanese um, presentation of chrysanthemums. And then we had several others throughout the garden, um, some in hanging baskets, which were just were kind of a cute idea. So, uh, so we, you know, we had to change gears um, for, for uh, reasons that were out of our control. And then as more staff came back, we were still understaffed to manage a greenhouse. So, uh, so we were very proud of being able to make it work in changing time, changing gears for changing times, for sure. And so, stay tuned for next year. Uh, you know, it's we're we're going to build on what we have done, sort of a uh, sort of a reboot for our chrysanthemum. So, wait, stay tuned for 2022. So, we've got some plans already for how it's going to look next year. Um, Safety and security, huge deal right now. People who may have been coming to the garden or may not be coming to the garden because safety and security, that is something that, uh, you know, there's always been issues in Old Town, Chinatown, but still it doesn't, it's nothing in comparison to what we've been seeing since COVID. And I saw a lot of frightening things when nobody else was downtown, just me and, and a lot of uh, the houseless population. and. Um, houseless population before COVID, you know, uh, they were there fine and, you know, I, 
great conversations with people and people that were had true down on their luck stories why they had ended up in a tent by our garden was so varied and so you know um they didn't want to be there and they, you know so it changed in covid uh, to where it's more of a we saw a definite shift in the type of houseless population in the area being violent um, schizophrenic or having severe mental health issues or drug issues so there was a shift definitely in um, what we were seeing and experiencing and with covid we've been experiencing a significant increase in break-ins harassment assaults and violent crimes in the gardens facilities and it's taken a toll on the entire garden inside and out um, we've had break-ins where people actually get inside the garden it's not happened once twice it's, it happens almost weekly um, they destroy things like roof tiles, which are very fragile, um, <clears throat> and uh, plants. Um, so we had some plants that were destroyed um, inside the garden, believe it or not. And there are ways they can get in. We have a lovely red pine next to our ticket booth that I can climb very easily. If you're, if you're a tree climber, if you've ever tried to clear, tree, climbed a tree in your life, you can easily get into the garden that way. We found several ways to get into the garden, so we're working on our security system. Uh, but it's a, something that has um, caused uh, issues. As you can see here, we got a, uh, we have our shishi, our lion, Chinese lion guardian. Uh, don't call it a food dog. It's not a food dog. It's a guardian lion. And uh, they're, they, they're a little frustrated these days, too. So they get, you know, graffiti um, almost once a week that we clean off. And so they are feeling it also. Um, they're, they're, they don't feel like they're able to do their job of protecting the garden. So here we are. So, so you know, kind of a, uh, another challenging time that we're going through. But wouldn't want to talk about challenging times unless I talked about what are we doing in the future? What are we doing right now to sort of contribute to our future? And um, uh, Penjing. So we're bringing back uh, our Penjing, um, our uh, program. Let's see, Zach Stanley is working on some of our Penjing that we have here. We've been working with the um, the Pacific Bonsai Museum. That's Aaron Packard, the curator there. Um, he uh, is interesting. When I first started Monsu, I made a trip up to ask him about our uh, talk about our uh, Penjing collection. And it turns out he actually started out in Penjing um, and uh, been developing this great partnership since. And so he very much is uh, is sympathetic to our plight. Being a Chinese garden and Penjing is such a rare. Um, uh, art form. It's different than uh, bonsai. We could talk more about that in question and answers. If people have a question about what's the difference between bonsai and penjing, I'd be happy to answer that. Chinese floral art. So this is um, Rosa Z. She's the president of the Chinese Floral Arts Foundation in Huntington, the only uh, certified Chinese floral artist school and pr practitioners outside of China, I do believe. And we are partnering with them in 2022 to bring this art form to Lansu. Um, so stay tuned for that. I'm really excited about introducing this. We've done floral arrangements before, but not a actual Chinese floral art um, practice. So stay tuned for that. I'm super excited to bring this to Lansu. Pine, uh, we've been working on our pine collection. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, um, we currently have 330, not pines, but 330 species in our garden. Uh, to put that in context, I was looking through our um, our binders. Of the, so our original collections was like 280 species. And so we have 330 now. And I think at our peak in 2005, 2010, we had 380. And so we're right in the middle of where it began and then at its peak, and then I don't know what happened um, to those 50 um, uh, stories I did here were certain diseases um, because of the reasons I talked about earlier, but I don't know the full story. Uh, you might have to ask Glenn Varco, um, and I know she talked about these these diseases that were taking out certain plants, and, and I know it was a very hard, stressful time. 
Um, but pine collection. So uh, we are developing Chinese pine. So we currently have a, uh, some Pinus sensiflora and Pinus thunbergia, which are Japanese red and black pines. However, it turns out there is a Chinese uh, pine, a red pine, which is tabula formis, and the Chinese black pine, and I'm going to get this wrong, Huangshinsiensis. Um, and those are those are commonly used in Chinese gardens in China. Um, we have our, they're not grown here typically, and so we have uh, sort of Japanese placeholders for them, which they're not really used in China, the Japanese red pine and Japanese black pine, except for maybe in Penjing, maybe occasionally in gardens. Um, but when the garden was planted a lot, we're, you know, we were using uh, what is available. Um, and there's beautiful specimens. Um, and you can see here, I wanted to make a distinction of, I talked about pruning and why we prune the way we do that might be different in a Japanese garden or from a Japanese garden or for any botanic garden for that reason. I mean, we use art as a guide, generally. Art, sometimes uh, nature, sometimes you'll see a um, pine tree growing on a cliff off of a rock and it has some beautiful structure to it. You might use that as an inspiration, <clears throat> finding the structure we want. But art is really the main, um, uh, the main inspiration for anything in a Chinese, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> really. Um, and so we look to art scenes for where we decide where we want to plant um, and then also use that as a guide for our pruning. So you might see this has still got some pruning to go. We can kind of see like we've got some interesting angles and, and you would not see this in a Japanese garden, by the way, you would not see these sort of angles that come down way below a 90 degree angle or back towards the tree. Um, uh, so you can ask more about that if you wish. Uh, but we do have a t sort of a, uh, you know, we also think about the poetry too. What is the, what is it trying to say um, uh, in the poetry as well? Uh, plum, also we're growing our plum, plum collection um and like uh, with the pine tree we're uh growing some from cedar are actively looking for certain types of plants and we've added five more pines to the garden over the last three years plums also we're adding to the garden we have prunus mume we're adding more of those elsewhere it began as an effort to just in case we thought well what if i was afraid these plum trees were going to die and it turns out they actually turned around they're doing great so I bought more plum trees thinking, well, are they gonna be a replacement? And it turns out, no, they can actually just go elsewhere in the garden. So we've been, I've been going by the original, the oldest uh, design that I can go with back in 99, Ms. Um, um, Ha, I believe was the contributor to that. It was, that wasn't exactly what was planted in the garden a year later, but it was the inspiration for um, what, uh, made its way into the garden and so I've been inspired by that and so there was a lot of plums intended to go like around where our horse shed is on the back side of the boathouse so I planted some there. Um, pines also kind of going with a, the original um, design that I found that I was very inspired by so more pines around the waterfall area um, rather knowing the fish pavilion. Persimmons so people don't really think of us as having a persimmon collection because we don't. Um, but uh, it's hard to get a good picture of the persimmon, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so we got, we're growing some uh, Chinese varieties um, from seed. And I believe we have a donation out there for a, oh, excuse me, is Diasporos rhombifolia, um, which is the princess persimmon. And they, they, you know, produce tiny little persimmons that are like the size of grapes. Um, <clears throat> probably we'll use that for penjing, which many plants that we're going to introduce into the garden that aren't currently in the garden, may have been in the garden in the past. Most likely, a lot of those will be, will be developed into penjing because, well, the garden was one time overcrowded <laughs> and now we've got it at a state of pretty good balance. So, um, <clears throat> with plants that we've added over the last three years. Also, we re reintroduced the phoenix tree. Um, 
and a few other plants, but uh, Penjing really, you know, is uh, is a great way to, yeah, we can have more plants, we can have more varieties of things um, without overcrowding the garden. So that's that's one of our goals. Um, bamboo, been adding bamboo grass. Um, the inspiration was the the poem by the Knowing the Fish about talking about lingering fragrance, which Sasa bamboo really gives you in the summer. And here's a quick list of plants that we are actively growing or actively looking for, or actively we have a potential, you know, donation out there. So, Circus uh, chinensis, Hibiscus metabolis, Pinus tabuliformis, Pinus huangshinsis, Polonia fortuni, which was not found by fortune, by the way, it was grown as a street tree in China for hundreds of years before he got there. Prunus persica, also Davidii, which I also have a problem with that. Um, and Cymbidium sinistus, since it's Lansu's, Lansu, sorry, um, namesake. Syringa oblata, Chinese purple lilac, which is, should be in every Chinese garden. Junipers, junipers, which we're using, we have three or four now, which we are using as punjing. We have a big giant one in the garden that fell during a nice storm. Uh, but why not have, why not just have three smaller ones? And then more crab apple. There is a lot of beautiful crab apple in the garden that we would like to bring back. And Buddha's hand citrus, part of the three blessings with peach, pomegranate, and Buddha's hand citrus. So this is for the years to come. Um, I will go ahead and uh, I think I need to minimize this because I think we're well into question and answer time. Everybody is still there. Yes, thank, yes, you, thank you, Justin, for um, this great presentation. Um, yeah, we can absolutely move into our Q&A. We've had some questions coming through. Um, just as a reminder for everyone, if there's a question, um, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and um, you should um, be able to, a little window will pop up and you can type in your question. If you can't figure out where that is, you can also type your question in the chat. Um, but we'll get started here. Uh, all right, our first question uh, is, what aspects of Lansu are Americanized? Um, that is a great question. And when people, um, when I started and there was a, a particular uh, question about, um, there was a certain uh, well-loved, of course, um, uh, clematis vine uh, over our begonia window, which used to be known as our crab apple. Uh, gate, so it's the begonia gate, um, and uh, it, you know, was fairly overgrown. I heard it had been a gift, and I remember talking to somebody saying that uh, uh, somebody was asking me about the um, the the clematis or clematis um, apple blossom, I believe it was called. And so, uh, I said, well, it's not really a Chinese garden plant. And uh, the conversation I was having with this person, but they're like, oh, but it is uh, native to China. And I was like, well, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> it's not a Chinese garden plant. And there were there have been some numerous examples of, uh, um, you know, plant it kind of, kind of more. And the way it was planted and growing over the, the gate, it was kind of conjured up more maybe English cottage garden, but I think, um, and I don't, I wouldn't necessarily even qualify it as Americanized, as maybe Westernized, or maybe kind of broadening that. And um, vines kind of growing on every, <laughs> every wall, um, albeit there are some vines in uh, Chinese gardens in China that do grow, but uh, uh, nearly every, <laughs> Nearly every stone and every uh, uh, trace of white wall inside the garden was growing with uh, vines or, um, you know, plants that had co were covering up the poetry. So um, I felt like it, uh, there was definitely a plant forward attitude and 
um, not really paying attention to as much to the poetry and the, the design of the begonia gate, for example. Um, and uh, and it was uh, my experience, uh, Francis Lee, for you know, for one, and a few other people, um, that a uh, few staff members that are Chinese, and it was my first. Uh, you know, my first example of like, you know, how, you know, new curator, people want to put in their two cents, but the common, the common uh, uh, comment was, is that, well, that, you know, that covers up the design, an important design of the garden, and it's, you know, it gives it a very kind of a westernized feel, and so I examined that like everything else, and, um, you know, it was a it was difficult because it was a very loved, well-loved vine, um, so in the end, it, um, it had to come down because we had to paint that wall. That wall was severely damaged. <clears throat> Took it down, painted the wall, put it in a pot uh, behind the bathrooms, which hope it, hopefully still recovering. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we painted the walls and then we planted some penjing in front of it. And uh, so it, it was one of those things that was kind of a, Unpopular decision with some people, um, but it was a, a overwhelming amount of people were like, well, thank you. Now I can see the, the overhead inscription now. I can see the shape of the Burgundia Gate. Um, so that's one example, um, you know, taking out a lot of the vines that were just covering the rocks or pruning them back was another example. So it was kind of a more, I can sort of more of a plant-centric, plant-centered um, approach or kind of view, um, and uh, that's kind of how I would classify. Um, and I think in the past, I can't, uh, in the past, I think a lot of plants um, that, you know, are sort of the Chinese novelties um, that are native to China, but not necessarily have anything to do with Chinese culture, um, are pretty prevalent. So um, not to say that they, can't, they aren't part of our story and they aren't part of the narrative, but I think there is a very, um, at, the, at times there has been a very Western, um, a Western botanic view. I hope that answers that question. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna do a quick, I'm gonna unshare your slides, Justin, really quick, doing a tech thing. And if you could turn your video on so we can see your lovely face. Oh, of course. Okay. I have the worst computer. Sometimes it takes me like five tries to try to do this. There we go. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions that came in, so this is great. Um, the next question is from Barbara. She asks, what is the special mix of fertilizer? She wants to know your secrets. <laughs> Ooh, well, I guess it won't be a secret after this. Um, uh, so there's actually a mix of, I believe it's 12 different ingredients. And you can get all of those gr ingredients mixed together in, in a bag from concentrates, which, which is they, they um, fertilizers, all that kind of stuff. They're down Johnson's Creek Boulevard in south end of Portland. And it's just their mix. It's their standard fertilizing mix. And it has um, bone meal, fish meal, crab meal, molasses, mycorrhiza, cotton meal, uh, a few other things. Um, so it's, uh, we use that at the Japanese garden um, where there hadn't been a, a real program um, we started that back in 20, not 20, uh, 2009, I think it was, and uh, really saw things like our shore pines that were on their way out turn around, um, and lots of other plants just start to thrive. Um, so I brought that here to Lansu, and it's been um, so far so good. And then, uh, you know, kind of beef it up next year for 2022, we'll probably fertilize more than we did this year. But then you start to taper off because you can't do that every year and then maybe every other year or certain plants one year and certain plants the other. So uh, you kind of get it up to a certain level of health that you want uh, and then taper it off and let them sort of not be 
too happy. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next uh, question comes from Linda. What kind of mental trans, oh gosh, excuse me. What kind of mental transitions did you need to make going from Japanese garden to Chinese garden? Um, that is a, that's an interesting question. So mental transitions um, first is making it, is basically just being real about the fact that there is a difference between Chinese gardens and Japanese gardens and the approach. However, there are so many things, there's actually more similarities than there are differences, I dare say. Um, so I couldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater um, because there is so much interconnection as some of you probably know that Japanese gardens really, really came over from, uh, at least the early ones came over from China, at least the inspiration. Um, later um, in the 1500s, the Muromachi period in Japan, they developed their tea garden which was really Japanese. Um, that was their Japanese um, kind of divorcing themselves from Chinese uh, aesthetics and, and so forth. But before then, um, it really was uh, China's influence. And so at a, you know, being at the Japanese garden for 12 years, I learned a lot of uh, the, um, about the Chinese garden as well and their influence on Japanese gardens. So I had already been in that learning mode um, that there's a lot of influence. And so it was kind of going back to China, Chinese um, history and um, hort uh, ornamental horticulture to sort of, it was kind of going back to the source for me. So, and I had to be very careful because I, I think, uh, you know, I, I identified certain plants that may have been pruned in, in more of a Japanese um, aesthetic and expression, and um, at least what was associated with Japanese aesthetic. And truth is, is that even some of that was gleaned off of Chinese art and the Chinese, same Chinese art that I look at to, to make, to get inspiration for pruning. So it's really not it's, you can't really draw a straight line in the middle and be like, one side is Chinese and one side is Japanese. It's all mixed in together. Um, and so I try to at least um, with visual cues, and they could be subtle, to try to, well, how would it be different than, than Japanese? It's like, well, going back to the art, Japanese aesthetics did evolve. We're talking, you know, 1500s especially. <clears throat> when the tea culture really uh, evolved. Um, <clears throat> so what was, what did it evolve from? So that's kind of where I go to is, is going back to the source of information that I kind of had learned in a different context. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question. And this is, what are the basic steps involved in caring for the chrysanthemums? Basic steps are, uh, well, let's see, right now, we are already starting our planning for next year. Like what uh, chrysanthemums are we going to buy? First, what do we want the collection to look like? Um, <clears throat> and so what colors we want, what types we want? Um, and you have to figure all that out by January. Um, so stay tuned for next year. It's going to be really cool. I've already, already planned it out. Um, <clears throat> and then you, um, you make cuttings of your chrysanthemum parent plants that you have. Um, and I think you can get two to five, depending on how, um, how big your chrysanthemum is. And the cuttings are about, oh, I don't know, two, five inches, somewhere in there. And you, you can put rooting hormone on them, but you, in my experience, you don't have to. <clears throat> and then you put some fertilizer in a four inch pot, some soil and just plop the stem in there, rip off some of the leaves. There's only one a few leaves on there. <clears throat> and, oh, maybe that's April, something like that. April, you get all your cuttings, but 2020, we realized we can do that in July. <laughs> so uh, if you wanna, if, if you're 
um, something happens to your collection, know that you can do it in July also. Um, but, uh, and then you just keep them watered, but not over watered. Um, they can actually dry out a little bit. Um, and then uh, eventually they get, um, uh, you know, you don't want them flowering too early. So if you see any buds uh, up until um, August, you want to take those buds off. So this bud, and then you can, depending on what you're doing, so that the cascades, you have to start early and grow them along sort of a cage. Um, you shape a cage that's sort of stiff that will hold the shape of the chrysanthemum. And uh, you would grow it along this sort of tiny trellis. And um, fertilizing, of course, is important, uh, I believe, once a month um, during the growing season. Um, and lots of sunlight. Lots of sunlight. They need a lot of light, um, especially if you're growing things like cascades. Also, there's some show quality ones. If you want to do that, just stake them at a certain point. Um, and but you, uh, <clears throat> our true chrysanthemum experts, actually not me, but uh, Jana Peranto <clears throat> and Wes Bevins, um, who they are the volunteers that really, really uh, held up our program the last couple of years. So. Uh, I could uh, pass those questions along to them, but that's that's a, a good deal of my knowledge right there. That's a great deal of knowledge. So thank you so much for sharing that. <clears throat> I love this next question. JJ asks, how do the koi interact with the lotus? Would there still be koi if the <laughs> pond was full of lotus flowers? Absolutely, the koi love it. Actually, that is a that they use that, that as uh, their breeding ground this year. Um, as you know, we uh, we have heron and osprey that pick off uh, koi. Um, the koi that are left are probably too big for them to take, but they doesn't mean they won't try and injure them even if they can't take them. They take uh, they take all of our goldfish. All the goldfish are gone. Um, <clears throat> they. Uh, we also have water lilies, and so the lotus and the water lilies actually create this very healthy ecosystem for the pond. Uh, <clears throat> so it is a great breeding ground for koi. It's a hiding place for koi from predators. They, it keeps them, uh, when the you know, sun is out, uh, like the triple digits, they all were gathering um, either in the dip, deepest part of the pond or around the lotus. And it creates... Um, <clears throat> It prevents uh, string algae when you have uh, plant materials like the lotus. And what we have found is they actually thrived. Uh, the people who said it wouldn't happen owe me a burrito, uh, but uh, <clears throat> it, that they they actually thrived um, m way more than I expected. They're already showing starting to show signs of spreading, and the blooms were never as beautiful. And the variety is incredible. Um, and fertilizing, uh, fertilizing is key. But the koi loved it. They actually couldn't stay out of them. We were, they liked to dig around in the soil because it was fairly soft and new. And, and uh, during the summer, there would just be hundreds of little baby koi frolicking in the lotus. It was kind of cool. That sounds lovely. <laughs> Um, I've got a comment and a question next. Um, Linda says, I love that persimmon tree. I have photographed it every season. And Christina asks, how do you keep the ripening persimmons looking so good? I have a hachia tree in my yard, which the birds and squirrels start tasting well before they are ripe and decimate. <laughs> I have to harvest when they are just turning orange and ripen off the tree. Well, uh, that is a good question. So I think we get lucky. Uh, <clears throat> we keep the, the, uh, the tree prune uh, for structure and we thin out the persimmons throughout the year, but otherwise you'd have way too much persimmon clustering and, and the branches would bow significantly. So we thin them out before they ripen, actually when they're quite small. So we, and then we just, we don't want to have them encrusted. We just want to have them like, you know, we'd see like 
on a Christmas tree, I guess, like little bulbs, like through sporadically throughout having their own space. And this year they have never looked better. I, I, and I don't know how to answer that question because we have lots of squirrels, lots of birds. Um, I think maybe they're all going for the pomegranate. <laughs> the, uh, so uh, there's really nothing too special that we do to protect it. We just let it do its thing and uh, we leave probably enough for them to take and still have a, a show. So I, that's really, don't know beyond that. I guess we got lucky. Thanks for sharing those tips. <laughs> the next question is, what resources do you use to maintain the original Suzo kinds of plantings versus other styles? For example, Sichuan. Um, so cleanliness is definitely a style uh, that would be uh, attributed to Suzhou's style. And that's, um, you know, having some leaves around is great, but the, um, uh, you know, we do know that um, keeping the, uh, the beds swept and um, letting some leaves stay if they're sort of nice, fresh, pretty leaves, but then not letting them collect in like the rocks and the, um, <clears throat> um, so that is one style that it would be particular to Suzhou. Um, and uh, just from some of the, the reading that we've done and extrapolating um, from Chinese gardens there. And cause you do see examples of Chinese gardens in China where you know, they like to leave their leaves down, but that's not necessarily the case in every Chinese garden. Um, so that's that's one thing. That's one, uh, and that has become our most important um, maintenance practice, and is uh, keeping the keeping the leaf debris at a minimum, not letting it collect and causing mildew problems, which it can do not letting it stay too long in the roof tiles because that also causes problems. And a lot of it is practical reasons also. Um, some of the problems we've seen in the past in the garden beds have been attributed to not just overgrown and too many plants, but also leaf debris that's just left for too long. Thank you so much. We're gonna enter a little bit of pinging territory here. We've got a few questions. The first batch is, will you have a section of the garden devoted to Penjing and will they be on view and when? So that is a $100,000 question, I don't know, something like that. Um, so we actually will have some throughout the garden, which actually for a Chinese garden is very appropriate to have Penjing sort of on display kind of throughout your garden. We might put, we. Uh, we have put a punjing stand in one of the garden beds by the begonia gate to replace the um, beloved uh, uh, clematis that was there. And so uh, how kind of peppering them throughout the garden, uh, we would love an Amizha, who is the, uh, the designer, landscape designer of the garden and back in 99. Um, she actually did propose a punjing courtyard in that northeast corner bed. Um, so yes, I would love to have a place to display them. It's just a matter of, um, you know, anybody see their name as the so-and-so Penjing Garden? Not just kidding. Uh, but um, so yes, so we would like to have a place for that. Uh, but in the meantime, we will, we will kind of place them throughout the garden. We have a few. We have a um, one from Mark Fosbrink, actually, it's an old Penjing that he um, sold us. Um, but uh, we have a donation from the American Bonsai Society. Um, and then a few that we're working on in-house that we're developing ourselves because, you know, we would like to get more donations. Um, but uh, there's, you have to be picky about what you choose. And there aren't a whole lot of uh, penjing that we would show in the garden that exists. Uh, so we have to be um, 
we have to be careful about what we acquire. Uh, but we're learning how to do it in-house. And so Zach um, Stanley actually apprenticed and still is apprenticing with Aaron Packard at the Pacific Bonsai Museum. So, uh, and learning the differences between bonsai and pinjing. And um, since we're on pinjing, people ask, how do you know what the difference is? If you have them side by side, I don't even know if I know. It's true, there are certain styles that are specifically Chinese, like land over water, um, which is, you know, you typically see the marble trays um, with like uh, stones on it um, and maybe some plants. And so that is a Chinese uh, penjing that you don't see in bonsai. There's other styles such as scholar style, which are very Chinese that uh, have made it into the Japanese um, repertoire. But uh, scholars is a very, very distinct Chinese bonsai. Um, but other than that, there's um, bonsai doesn't typically use stone with the plants. They'll do stone. Uh, or they'll do plants. Usually the two don't meet together. And it's how you view view it really. It's with um, Penjing, uh, you could see something like, a, oh, Venus, Sun, and I were talking about one of the Penjing and we're like, oh my God, it looks like it has like a, it's a Tai Chi movement. And, you know, we were talking about what we see sort of this idea or emotion in it. Um, and that's not how you look at a bonsai. A bonsai, you look at like, wow, how beautifully executed. This is like a deification of nature if I've ever seen one. It's that's, and learning techniques in a Japanese garden, which is definitely about technique. Um, <clears throat> there's technique in penjing and there's rules, but with penjing, you get to break the rules far more than you do in a Japanese garden, I think. Uh, I could, I probably told, I could be wrong. There's. I guess it depends on how experienced you were. Like my boss, the Japanese garden, can break the rules more than I can. Anyway, um, so uh, so that's put it in a nutshell. And it's been around for a lot longer. Penjing. Um, I, I once heard somebody say oh, that the that they came around about the same time, and they're fighting over who came first, Penjing or Bonsai. And that's not true. Penjing definitely was around two, at least a thousand years before it was brought to Japan. So we do know that for a fact, and I don't think anybody's fighting about that. So I'm setting the record straight. Awesome, thank you. Um, just really quick, we typically do end our Q&A at 11, but we have so many questions. And the beauty of being virtual is that we could continue on a little bit longer, if that's okay with you, Justin. Awesome. Sure. I, I love answering questions. Oh, excellent. There, there's just, they just keep coming in. So this is great. Um, so for the audience, if you can hang on and listen, that would be awesome. If not, um, you know, these questions and this presentation will be, um, is being recorded. And so you can always come back and listen to more of this Q&A, but we hope you can stick around and keep asking more questions. <laughs> All right. We're going to go back to Penjing and here. So the next question is, why are the Chinese flower arts and penjing less spread than other arts like bonsai? I'm sorry, what was that question again? Less? Less spread out or maybe less well known? Okay. Um, I, I may not be, I may not know the exact answer to this, but I can maybe make it more of a guess. Um, Japanese gardens came to uh, North America and Europe well before Chinese gardens, I believe, came to uh, outside of, uh, you know, made their way outside of China. And I think there's some good reasons for that, meaning um, maybe not good reasons, but reasons that Japanese culture was able to to spread out of Japan. I think maybe easier than Chinese culture was um, over the last, uh, you know, the 20th century, particularly. Um, so Japanese gardens, you know, the oldest ones in America that we know of, is Sarat uh, the Hakone Japanese Garden in Saratoga, who good, good friend of mine, Jacob Kellner, is the the um, curator there. Um, I think they're one of the oldest. The 
Tea Garden at, in San Francisco is old. And these are, these are over 100 years old, these gardens. Um, and there's a few around that are these sort of uh, what have been accepted and are called sort of a, oh, a, a Victorian era Japanese garden. And when we talk about Chinese gardens and Western influence, Japanese gardens, it's a thing. It's, it's recognized that, well, they weren't really authentically Japanese. They were definitely like a, this is the World's Fair version of Japanese garden. So you see lanterns everywhere and you know, it's very Japanese and so <laughs> visually. And so didn't really bring any authenticity. It just brought all of the, the visuals um, and the, th the stereotypes. So, but that's been accepted as like, that's what it was. It was a Victorian era Japanese garden. And so I think it became all of the rage in North America, uh, especially by the fifties where friendship gardens were being built all over North America. Seattle's, you know, I grew up in Seattle and our uh, sister city is Kobe, Japan. And we had a, a sister city Japanese garden built um, in honor of them. Um, beautiful Japanese garden, by the way. Uh, first, my first experience at a, at a Japanese garden, and it was like nine or 10 on a field trip. Anyway, um, so, uh, so I believe, and then it just really captured the imagination, like Sunset Magazine was featuring Japanese gardens. And, you know, and so this, it really kind of captured the imagination. And so bonsai also, as an extension of that, we made it into every American household, <laughs> pretty much, and so that's great. It, it's um, it's an art form that I don't know if Westerners appreciated the culture, but they appreciated the aesthetic. And so uh, there are some exceptions to that, of course. But then Chinese gardens were just now starting to see that same uh introduction that japan japanese gardens saw 100 years ago so i think that's why i think that's why it's still scarce i feel like it's a little bit of, we're at an unfair advantage because people when they do come to the garden they're like oh bonsai or ikebana <laughs> and um and so at least for a long time we will be compared to the japanese aesthetic, which is, uh, you know, there are, yes, similarities, um, for sure. And we do know that there was a lot of um, Chinese influence in Japan. But we do know over the last 100 years that there was Japanese influence on China when it came to um, floral arts in Beijing. So there you go. So you get this back and forth. Um, so that's uh, me coming from more of an anecdotal perspective than than uh than uh somebody who would get up and you know do a lecture on this so i hope that that helps i think that was great <laughs> um i've got another question on penjing um and i apologize i forgot to say some people's names so um this question comes from mary ann do you have any recommendations for places and people to learn penjing absolutely Mark Vosbrink, good friend of the garden, he um, teaches uh, Panjing. Uh, actually, he I think he frames it under the uh, bonsai classes, I do believe, but he also teaches Panjing in, uh, in that class. And it's at the um, Gresham Japanese Garden. So they have a, a garden in downtown Gresham called Tsuru Island. Um, so you just look that up online. Uh, the, Gresham Japanese Garden. I think you just have to follow the links to find like workshops and stuff. And um, and then hopefully, actually, we're um, just beginning to start talking about um, classes here that we would teach ourselves, um, developing um, a program for that. So stay tuned. So um, uh, we've had Robert Cho, a good friend. Brian Bars, who's a penjing master in the Seattle area, come down and uh, do some workshops also. So uh, it's a program where that uh, is near and dear to my heart. And the reason is, is because I think uh, a lot of people don't, that some people uh, don't have it, had a chance to appreciate 
challenging and appreciate the difference and appreciate the different approach and understand its history. So that's, to me, the main thrill is people understanding the history of it and how, how, how it could be a, a different art form. So, so there you go. And then also floral arts uh, we're bringing in um, 2022. So I'm in talks with the Chinese Floral Arts Foundation uh, USA to start bringing some of their workshops up here. Uh, we were going to a couple of years ago, uh, but that got just delayed. So here we are, 2022 could be the year where we start to see actual, the Chinese floral arts um, sort of take root. And we haven't had that in Portland. And um, so they are, they're associated with the Huntington. And so they are so excited to, I don't know if down the line we'll ever have, be able to start a chapter here of the Chinese Floral Arts Foundation, but wouldn't that be cool to have one in Portland? Very cool. <laughs> I agree. All right, our next questions are coming from, uh, ooh, gonna be a whole bunch about specific plants I like this. Uh, so this one is Cymbidium. Do you put these in your greenhouse in the winter? When can you take them out of the greenhouse? In spring? Uh, or later, <laughs> and then please explain a little more about, oh, we'll do that second one. We'll, <laughs> we'll come back to that second part. Uh, the Cymbidiums, actually, I had them in my office. <laughs> so we put them in um, some beautiful orchid pots, and I took them up to my office, set them in the window, um, and <laughs> took care of them that way. I just was afraid of them getting lost and of course, now we don't have a greenhouse. Um, so, and I've heard stories of in the past, well before my time, of there being a secret greenhouse somewhere that had some uh, cymbidiums for Lansu. I don't know if that still exists, or maybe I dreamed it one day. And I, but uh, uh, so I would love, but a lot of the orchids, I would love to um, uh, grow are also ground orchids. We have one, well, we have ground orchids like the Blatilla, which is a, not a cymbidium. It's a ground orchid, like a wild orchid, but the, um, the traditional Chinese orchids that you would find in like the paintings, the woodblock prints, all of that is um, the uh, cymbidium insifolium, could be insif uh, cymbidium chinensis or floribundum and georgii, which are all very, very similar. Small blooms. You're not talking about your big tropical showy blooms. None of that. It's small-ish cymbidium blooms, which are colors of chartreuse or maroon or brown or um, uh, those kind of golden -y colors. So they're not what people would call showy, um, but they are my favorites only because they are so hard to find. <laughs> Um, and so we've been looking, I, I actually was lucky I found some on eBay, oddly enough, and they came from China via eBay. Um, so the only thing is they are really, they are fairly difficult to, to take care of. And I have to say during COVID uh, that we lost a few of them. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes that's the, the, uh, the way of a gardener, you can't, you know, things happen. Um, but uh, so anyway, we're um, in, we're actively uh, rebuilding our orchid collection. So I hope that helps. We don't, uh, we don't uh, put them in the bathtub with ice cubes like some people do. Maybe, uh, maybe I should start doing that. Maybe I'll bring them home and do that. But uh, if anybody has, uh, you know, we do talk to the Orchid Society. Uh, They're friends of ours. And so they offer help. And again, we were gonna have a big orchid, Chinese orchid show in COVID, you know. So stay tuned for that uh, as this year progresses and we revisit our uh, program with the Orchid Society, then you'll start to see more of that. Awesome. Uh, really quick, there's a comment. Carla says, we do have Cymbidium sinens in ground near the tea house. They bloom late summer into early fall. That's right. 
and it's really low to the ground. So unless you're like really, really looking, you're not going to see them. And it's you really have to squat down to look at it. We moved another plant away from there was a camellia there that was going right on top of it. We moved it to another spot so you can see this <laughs> bloom that still nobody really sees. But uh, more plant, more orchids like that. I would love to do in that section right there, Jennifer, uh, a huge grove of them. So we'll see if we can do that. That's great. Second part of this uh, question is, please explain a little more regarding Japanese versus Chinese pruning of pines. Um, so a lot of the scholar art um, paintings, for instance, especially during the Song era, which was the, the I believe the 900s, the 1200s, correct, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, um, there are a lot of, and this was precedes the Ming Dynasty, just before the Ming Dynasty, and lots of examples of uh, plant materials. And the interesting thing about Chinese gardens and the plants is the, uh, the garden itself and the garden materials were actually more inspired during this time, during the Ming Dynasty, by the art and not by nature necessarily. So it was it was inspired by the art that was inspired by nature. So you have this sort of this filtered lens of what uh, nature is. And so keeping that in mind, uh, you know, uh, the plants have to have a very artistic interpretation. Except for Jen Wen Ming, who is one of the mentioned scholars in our garden uh, from the Ming Dynasty. He was the, um, you know, he talked about the, uh, um, the Artless Garden, the Humble Minister's Garden, also known as the Artless Garden, which he decided to take a different route, meaning this garden is not going to be artistic necessarily or based on those kind of values. It was going to be something a little bit deeper to him. Anyway, so to make that distinction, but uh, so we go, like if you look at uh, old paintings of plum trees and how the branches zig and zag and um, awesome trunk shapes. There's a pine that's planted on top of our waterfall that if you look back at some of these paintings, you can Google a lot of them. It's a Ma Yuan, Y-U-A-N. Um, I believe it's called Scholar Watching a Waterfall or something. And so you can see the inspiration of why that pine is planted planted the way it is from that painting. At least that's my guess. I'm, I'm, I'm making that that correlation, I think, um, as opposed to be like, oh, what happened to this pine? I think they planted it wrong. I'm like, oh, no, they went by the art. Um, so that is a main guide. Also, um, I'm very conscientious about, you know, I know there's some things that have been pruned and what people would perceive as a Japanese style. So I try to think of ways, well, how do we, how do we change that? And some of them are not as easy as others. Uh, there's a few pines that are like, well, we'll, cry, we'll, we'll deal with that someday. But also there's awesome pictures online of um, Chinese pines growing on the mountaintops, the Huangshen um, uh, area, and then um, so the yellow, mountains area. There's um, lots of beautiful examples of pines in nature, kind of like if you want to compare it to, we go to the coast here and see the shore pines hanging off the rock cliffs. How do they look? What do they look like? They've been there hundreds of years. We want our pines to look like they're hundreds of years old um, and Im imitate what you see in the art. And so therefore you kind of use that as an example um, and there's a little bit of artistry going. I don't think you can, uh, you, you know, you think you have to go beyond technical expertise. You have to kind of use your imagination. Uh, the Sunset Magazine rules of pruning are like no crossing branches and no rubbing, you know, all, all of these rules that, well, generally do apply here, but not always. You have to find, you, sometimes you see a, 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 a branch that grows back the other way towards the wall from the front of the tree and it, it 
and but it also is contributes to the character of the tree. Why would you prune that? So you have to get out of this mode of of just doing things the way you always do them and look at them at the way you always have looked at them and step back and and what is the tree trying to tell you in the context of where I'm at? It's harder. To, it would be really hard for me to write a, a Chinese garden pruning manual because it's really this. It's very. It can be esoteric. It's really not to you get your hands and to the tree. Um, and then having pruned Japanese pines and maples and many camellias and many other things for hundreds of times, hundreds of times, um, you start to do things the same way almost by a template. And then, yeah, I had to step away from that and think critically first. And so that's just with pruning. You know, there's other things like um, plantings and how do you plant a pine? Which way does it face? Which way does it, how, where, how is it communicating with its surroundings? Why do you plan in that specific space? So there's some of that too, that is, you know, a, a Japanese way of doing things and a Chinese way of doing things. So I just have to take my cues from art, from uh, people who I trust around. Um, a lot of Japanese mentors that I've had that uh, also went to the school of Chinese gardening and. They know their way around a Chinese garden also because they also learned that. So I can be like, how do I do this differently? I can call upon my, uh, you know, the people who I trust that would, uh, you know, help help me. You know, everybody should have a mentor in their life, right? So, so I have a few, and uh, it's been so. Therefore, not just jump into things and just do things without thinking. And that's the main thing. That's the main thing, and analyze. Uh, how am I doing this different? Or is it similar? That could be the case sometimes. Thank you so much. I'm back here shaking my head about, look, you know, looking out in my yard. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that I'm doing wrong. <laughs> we have a couple, yes, thank you. <laughs> we have a couple of questions. Um, one uh, I'm going to put these two together. Alan asks, is there a relationship with the original Suzo designers? And a follow-up question is, have the designers come back and um, to see how the garden is doing and given recommendations? Yeah, I have an active relationship with uh, Feng Shua. I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher her name, Ms. Ha. And uh, uh, she uh, is in Suzo and we email, um, fairly regularly and um, I ask her questions all the time and what was your what was the original intent for this and why did this happen things like that and uh, or do you think it's a good idea to do this and her answer is always it's your garden now <laughs> so she she lets me uh, she she gives me the freedom to make decisions which is pretty awesome but uh, unfortunately so the she uh, uh, a lot of uh, we were going to have a delegation in of course 2020 like everything there's so many everything was going to happen in 2020 and then didn't so very frustrating on my end we were going to have so many amazing things and programs happen but uh, so I have not met her in person uh, but I do um, and uh, some of the other delegation I uh, there's a delegation we had in 2019 which she was not among, but I, I did uh, meet some of those folks. And um, and it's just, you know, I, I think the main thing is that when they come, I just want to be like sort of proud of what we're presenting. I know, I know in the past from stories I've heard, Ms. Huh said, oh, you guys have let this plant go and this should have been proved this way or, you know, things like that. And um, I just wonder what she would say when she, when she and I walked through the garden and I hope, um, and I, I did come across some notes that she had left um, on certain plants, how to see them, uh, recommendations on pruning and why. And so I've been kind of taking that too and, and considering what her perspective was and why and thinking about that and infusing that into the many other things that I'm talking about, infusing that into uh, some of our practices. But there's a lot of um, a lot of blank spaces 
as far as like what is a train Chinese tradition and learning uh, as much as I would like to learn from them, it's harder than like a Japanese garden. We just were so you know lucky to you know have uh, professional gardeners and pruners and everything you know you name it come over from japan i was sent to japan twice and to learn and um and it's just not the same now a days with uh china or it's not as easy um so uh i'm looking forward to the day where so we are that's one of our goals as a uh, as a an organization is to reestablish those sort of goals of working together uh, i'd love to be able to send one of my gardeners over to China for, you know, uh, to put it all into context and to learn more and, um, and vice versa to have a Chinese gardener come over here and work with us. I think that's very important to get that kind of firsthand cultural experience because, you know, every, all of the gardeners were all American, white, um, and we do the best we can to really stop and honor the tradition examine the information that's there, that's available, um, and think about it in a way that's like, well, how do we, how, how do we, you know, we're the ones that are hired to, to, to do this, but then how do we get the, the true, and we do have, Jap, uh, sorry, Chinese uh, staff members that I do glean a lot of context and a lot of but I would just love, love, love to have more of that from Sujo. So that's an awesome question. And that's yet another thing that we're picking up, uh, you know, post COVID. And uh, so stay tuned for that. There's a lot of, uh, there's just so many things that, um, that uh, would have been, would have been uh, popping off like popcorn kernels right now if it wasn't for that. So, so th thanks for that question, Ellen. I appreciate that. Awesome, thank you. We're going to go back to a uh, couple of the individual plants, I think. Um, the next one is uh, from Jan. <laughs> the magnolia in the pot on the porch of the Scholars Hall looks leggy and sad. As a fragrant magnolia, it's one of my favorites. Can it be helped? On the porch in front of the Scholars, there's a rhododendron. I don't know... I want to just double check. I, we're talking about the same thing. So on the scholars hall in front, when you're facing it on the right hand side in a big pot under an eave, there is a rhododendron. Um, and I, oh God, I, you guys, this is embarrassing. I'm so bad with plant names. I'll, I, I know it starts with a V. Uh, and it's not a tropical roadie, as far as I know. It's borderline. Um, and it grows through um kind of the uh leak lattice there that's the, is that the one we're talking about oh uh, uh, carla says rhododendron vixianum thank you carla um so if that's the one we're talking about we are actually in uh talks of repotting that I'd like to get a fancier pot for it. Uh, we do need to prune. We've actually been doing some pruning on it. Um, leggy is leggy is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, like I said, you know, looking through sort of a different lens of how plants should be presented, or and leggy is uh, sometimes could be actually more beautiful. Um, I think this is a very beautifully structured plant. We do do some pruning to make sure it doesn't get any leggier. Um, and we're going to do some pruning for structure. But there's some plants that I don't have a whole lot of experience with pruning. So therefore, I'm not going to do anything drastic until we do small things, see how it reacts. A little bit of pruning back, keeping out the dead. But the structure on that is quite beautiful, so I don't think we would change much. But we are going to repot that. Thank you. 
see. We've, uh, we're going to try to wrap up at about 11.30, so I'm going to put in the last couple of questions here. Um, we will continue at the Tea House, and then other questions, if you're really dying to know, feel free to email <laughs> us at First Saturday, and we'll pass that question on to Justin as well. Um, but um, we're going to try to finish a couple more questions, fit those in. This next one comes from Sabina. Um, there's a comment first. Thank you, Justin, for your wonderful presentation. In one of my visits before the pandemic, I saw the willow tree had been trimmed way too far above the pond. I thought the branches were supposed to be kept barely above the water so that ripples are created when breezes dip them, thus tickling a poet's inspiration. Please comment. Thank you. Ah, awesome. I love this question. So yes, uh, so the, uh, it hadn't actually been pruned <clears throat> when I started. It was way too tall. It was like this tall gangly willow. I actually pruned out like some dead and some things that were, uh, but it had not really been pruned until 2020 when we were closed because uh, Sabina, this was also a problem for me. So uh, I had just been waiting for just a moment to like just make some severe cuts on the willow. So I did 2020, um, Gabe Weiss, our Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese um, uh, uh, masonry uh, consultant was doing work on the roof there in the boathouse, fixing some of the roof. And I, I'm like, hey, Gabe, can I get up there with you? And I made some major, big, huge cuts on that willow. And because I knew it was just going to reward with tons more branches. So, so take a look at that now. You'll see it's about 15 feet, maybe 20 feet shorter. It's below the roof line of the, the, the um, boathouse. And the branches do come down to the water now. We may actually thin it out ever so slightly because it is very heavy. However, uh, we do now anything that kind of sprouts up above its current, we have it fairly slender because we can't really have a wide willow in our garden. It's too small, our garden's too small. Um, however, uh, so take a look at it. You'll notice that it's dramatically different now because I took out five, we're talking about, uh, oh, I don't know, huge diameter branches and not that you would ever be able to tell now. So anyway, take a look at it. Tell me what you think if it's how different it looks now. Great, thank you. Um, Linda asks, um, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> let me try that again. Uh, thank you for this story. I would love a good reference on the differences between Chinese and Japanese garden aesthetics. Um, a good reference like a book. Um, I've written some articles about it. Um, and uh, we do talk about it, but as far as an actual book, I might have to get back to you on that because it has to exist somewhere. If it does, I haven't read it. Uh, I just have gone by what I know. Um, so that's a good question. I don't know if there is a reference book. I imagine it exists. Maybe I could write a book if it doesn't, I don't know. Uh, so good question. I'm sorry, I can't quite answer that. We'll say more to come. <laughs> more to come. All right, I'm gonna wrap up the Q&A with uh, one of our, there were many comments on this great presentation, but Roger um, said it so nicely. He writes, terrific presentation, Justin. It was clear from being in the garden that the horticulture collection has improved dramatically. So good to get back, oh, excuse me, so good to get the backstory. It is obviously in very good hands. Best wishes for your future in Lansu. Oh, thank so you, Roger. Thank, yeah, thank you so much, Justin, for sticking with us for this longer than planned Q&A. Um, and for the audience that's still with us, thank you so much for joining us as well for this. Um, we will still have the tea house in a few minutes. So if you are interested in that, we'll definitely still continue that and at least um, have some time there. 
And then as you can see really quick on our slide, please join us in the new year um, for uh, Linda Walton's talk on rethinking Chinese history in the Song and Ren dynasties. Um, and that information will be on our website soon. And those announcements also will go out, of course, um, probably mid-December before the holidays. If we don't see you at the tea house, please do enjoy the rest of your winter holidays and we wish you all well. And thank you again for coming, Justin. Thank you again for this great presentation and the Q&A. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.